Coming soon, the new series, Famous Memories, where I get the absolute privilege of talking to some Scotland rugby legends. We've got the Hastings brothers, Nathan Hines, Chris Patterson, Tommy Seymour, and Grant Gilchrist. Keep your eyes peeled, because it's gonna be an absolute belter. This month on Famous Memories, the word legend gets thrown around quite a lot, but we've got two absolute legends. It's the Hastings brothers. Enjoy. Right, I am a, a rose between two legends today. This pair doesn't need introductions, really. It's Gavin and Scott Hastings. Uh, here to reminisce a little bit about the World Cup over the years. You know, it, it, you were there at at the inception, what was that like? It was a really bizarre one, but you know, with Gavin and I being captain in 1986 um, against France, uh, it was it was a, it, everything was new. So to get this invitation to go to New Zealand, it was extraordinary. The first World Cup, and it suddenly just happened with the International Rugby yeah. Board, which is now World Rugby. So it was a step onto uh, you know into the unknown. Mm -hmm. For me, it was it was really disappointing because the next day it was it, there was a full on three and a bit hour training session. And at the end of that session, I actually pulled my hamstring. So my World Cup kind of evaporated at that point. And although I played against Romania... For how long? Uh, for about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Um, That's not... It, still it a was, World Cup cap. It was still a World Cup 10 cap. seconds more than I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was an embarrassment. But uh, again, it was another sort of uh, indication of the sort of amateur way mm. we went around things. You know, nowadays, you know, to, to, to have a soft tissue injury in the opening 40 hours you know, of a tour is unacceptable. It just wouldn't happen. You know, you, there's a protocol you go through yeah. to not only rehydrate, but to stretch, relax, et cetera, and ensure that, that the team are in the best yeah. prep. But there, it was just hammer and tongs. And for me, it was really frustrating. But again, it was a step into the unknown. And I, I suppose out of my injury, Scottish rugby learned mm. of, of those protocols and improved them as time went on. Mm. What, 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 try and you know, paint the picture of, of what it looked like. Because I suppose now we know what a World Cup looks like and we know it's full stadiums of 60,000 and, and, and everything that comes with it. But, you, you know, capacities were 14, 15,000. Like, these were, you know, it, it was humble, yeah. was it? it? It was amazing. I think, um, you know, we were, we were based down in, in the South Island in, in Christchurch. And um, I'm not actually sure. Why did we go to Auckland in the first place? Well, we had to go there anyway. Was there an opening dinner? There was an, dinner there was an opening dinner for all the teams had to congregate and then they cascaded across the, the country. Yeah. So we, um, we had our first game against uh, France in, in Christchurch. And, um, you know, it, it was amazing because obviously the first time that a lot of us had ever been to New Zealand and the similarities between New Zealand and Scotland were just mm. so amazing that and street names named after, you know, obviously streets here in Edinburgh and, and whatever else. And, uh, you know, we, we felt a real uh, um, accord with, with New Zealanders and they were very, very welcoming to, to us. And I, I do remember being in the bowels of the stadium um, in the change rooms before taking the field against France. And, all we could hear was a skirl of the bagpipes and, you know, just a noise. And you think you're on the other side of the world. And, and yet there's people that are out um, being and people saying my grandfather was born in Scotland. You know, I'm come from our broth or from Aberdeen or Stornoway or whatever else. And, uh, you know, well, it was amazing. Um, but <laughs> I do also remember we used to sort of change hotels on a Sunday. And back in the day, you know, Sunday night, I think, was the first the, the night that all the families would go out for their evening, evening meal, you know, the big sort of celebration of the week. And we'd always, you know, arrive late afternoon and get down into the hotel restaurant for, for a Sunday evening meal. And then a waitress or a waiter would come over and say, now, do you want to know what the specials are? And after about two changes of Sundays, the specials were the same every single hotel you went to. You got roast pumpkin soup, you got roast New Zealand lamb, and for pudding, you got pavlova. 
<laughs> and this happened for six weeks throughout New Zealand. That pumpkin soup, New Zealand lamb and pavlova every single Sunday night. And that's what the country was like in those days. Nowadays, of course, with their vineyards and their fantastic seafood and brilliant meats and lamb and, and everything, catering for everything, their, their breadth of food and mm. cuisine is just amazing. But back then, it was like going back in time to, to when Scott and I were growing up as, as kids mm -hmm. in many respects. So, 91 rolls round. It was hosted within the Five Nations. Was that sort of our, our chance to put it on our way and, and sort of answer back? Was that a bit? In many respects, it was. And, and you've got to put 91 in context that in 1989, a number of Scots players got selected to go on the British and Irish Lions tour cool. to Australia. Um, we won the series 2-1 there. Ian McGeechan was at the helm of coaching. And we came back knowing that the 1990 uh, season was really important. Um, obviously, Scotland won the Grand Slam then. So the team knew we were in a really good position. And when the draw came out, we knew that if we kept on winning in the tournament, we'd play every game at Murrayfield. So in many respects, 1991 was a, a really good opportunity. And, 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 and so the, the platform was set where our standards of fitness, uh, that four-year cycle, the improvement in the team was what generated that momentum. So there was a real buzz um, going into that, that 91 tournament that, again, we felt we had a really good chance. And being on our home paddock, um, you, you, you suddenly realise that this was a, a, a huge opportunity. And especially with me, because of my experience in 87, I knew that I needed, a, personally, a strong tournament. Um, so, thankfully, um, I was selected for the opening game against Japan mm. here at Murrayfield. And uh, I got the opening try of the tournament for Scotland. And, and suddenly that got us up and running. And, and it was a, a competitive game. Uh, but at the same token, it was all about the journey and then what happened next. So, for me, the whole preparation was, was, uh, was really well uh, mapped out for us by not only our coaches, but by this time, strength and conditioning had come in, the understanding of diet, nutrition, weights had started coming in the game. So we were moving from that utter amateur period yeah. into this almost this semi-professional period. And when rugby players went on tour, you became a professional rugby player, basically. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's the thing. You were beginning to professionalise, yeah. but you were... You're still living amateur lives as well, though? Oh, we all had yeah. jobs. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the thing, and, and that's what determines. We obviously didn't get paid for, for playing rugby for Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all had to go into the office. Um, I, <laughs> I do remember we stayed in uh, Dalmahoy Hotel on the outside of town, and um, I think Scott got every single piece of clothing that he ever owned over a period of four or five weeks that we were <laughs> staying there, because obviously World Cup covered all your laundry expenses and whatever <laughs> else. So Scott, you know, he took the curtains off his, uh, <laughs> off his, his yeah. lounge and took his curtains in <laughs> to get... I got my suits. Uh, Every single shirt I owned just, was utterly um, immaculately dry clean um, over the six he's weeks. He's taking his wife's stuff in <laughs> and getting it. <laughs> you sure know, you wear this? Room number 410. And, oh, this is a nice dress. <laughs> yes, I wear this on a Sunday morning you know, to church. So. <laughs> it's true. But and that's, I mean, what, that's what happened. I and I must admit, once Scott did it for the first couple of weeks, I thought, that sounds quite like a good idea. So I, I would find polo shirts, I've worn them, oh, worn them once, or oh, they're very smelly, shoved them. We must have cost thousands and thousands of pounds between us. And I would find these, these beautifully wrapped, individually wrapped, and, and in those days you got them. And I found them five or six yeah. years later <laughs> in the bottom of some bag, you know. Got, With the collar, stif a, collar stiffeners in, yeah, yeah, beautifully I mean, immaculate. Well, that, <laughs> that's probably my abiding memory of the 91 World Cup. What, yeah, what a sight. The laundry so, done. You, you, all the laundry. <laughs> lovely shirts done. I look very good going to work for the next few months. Yeah. <laughs> the abiding memory. Um, so, 1995. It, that, for so many people, certainly for me, I, you know, it's such a special tournament. Yeah. Did it feel that special at the time? Did it feel that historic to be living in that? Without a doubt, it was such a, a brave call um, for World Rugby to make that decision, to take the tournament to South Africa. 
and it was a step again. It was it was a step into the unknown. It, you know, this apartheid. We didn't fully understand what apartheid really mm -hmm. meant. We were there going as sports people, but we also knew that as the game moved on from that amateur tournament in '87 to a kind of semi-professionalism of '91, '95 was heading to that professional cusp. Mm -hmm. Um, I came across my, my training diary. It was a 52-week training diary. Wow. All about what, what was going to make me a better player as I headed into South Africa. And, of course, you know, there was a lot of competition for places. There was no guarantee that I was going to be part of the team, nor Gavin. And, and, Steady. You know, <laughs> but, again, <laughs> you know, we, we'd, we'd experienced a, another Lions tour uh, together, the only pair of brothers to ever to go on two British and Irish Lions tours. So Phenomenal. we were kind of in tune with each other, but also the team had moved on from 1990. They'd played some expansive rugby. There were some new uh, new caps involved. Mm. Um, and there was an excitement about going to South Africa. And yeah, undoubtedly there was, uh, it was it was a big tournament. It was huge. Um, and by that time, you know, Scotland had missed out on a Grand Slam in 1995 against England down at Twickenham. Um, I'd gone through a full mix of emotions, having been dropped, dropped that season, um, but got myself in back into the squad. So huge competitiveness uh, there, but also an understanding that this was going to be a tournament like no other. Uh, and such excitement and massive crowds, great rugby conditions in a country that none of us really had... A, had um, had been to, so it was um, it was an amazing experience. How did you feel at the time? Well, I knew I was going to retire at the end of the World Cup, and obviously having captained Scotland for um, three seasons, um, and as Scott said, you know, we went down to um, Twickenham with a chance of the Grand Slam in '95, and we didn't play well enough. We didn't deserve to win, but I really felt that we could go to the World Cup and. Uh, and be very, very competitive. And, um, you know, we, uh, we, we went down there with a lot of excitement, a lot of anticipation, a lot of confidence. And, uh, you know, I do remember our opening game against the uh, Ivory Coast. It was only the second game. Um, South Africa played Australia the previous evening. And I, my message to the guys was that a lot of the teams will be watching us. So let's go out and show them that we're capable of, of playing. And, you know, we won 89-0, and, and we went out and we, we played well, and I think we, we scored a lot of tries that gave us a lot of confidence. And, you you um, say we, you, you know, scored a lot of tries. Four tries in that match is a bit of a showreel, but the, it, you're right, it's the, it's, the, it's the flair that you all seemed to play with that day. It was the confidence. It was, you know, it was just great rugby to watch. You know, as Scott alluded to, the, the conditions were fantastic, and, and, you know, compared to... 87, where you were playing in front of eight or 10,000 in, in 87. Here, you were playing in biggish stadiums, the first game against Ivory Coast. It was just a fantastic ground, and there was probably 20,000 people in there. But, you know, we, we, we went out and, and played with a lot of intent, and I think we were pretty fit in, in those days. And, and so, yeah, it, it got us off to a good start. We then played Tonga in, in Pretoria and played very, very well that day against another South Sea uh, Ireland team and um, you know they're known for the ferocious tackling as well but we again we knuckled down and played very very well um, and then we came to the big one. Well yeah, exactly so France another match that although it was 22-19 in the end France winning by three. Oh you spoiled it. I know I know. <laughs> you spoiled but, it JJ. But the big thing is. We didn't know what the score was. <laughs> the um, each, I mean, each side only scored one try in that match. That must have been a, another sort of tetchy affair, was it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I can't... I don't remember it necessarily being a tetchy affair. It was always going to be close. On the occasion of our 50th cap, Scott and I, we played our very first cap for Scotland against France. Eight years later, in the corresponding mm. fixture, we played against France, having won every game at Murrayfield against France up till that point. We lost their 50th uh, match playing together against France in 1994. The following year, we'd been trying for 26 years to win in Paris, and we managed to get over that hoodoo. We, we won the game. Scott wasn't playing that day, which probably <laughs> allowed us to win that game. 
And then a few months later, we're playing France in the World Cup. And, um, you know, we, we knew that whoever won this would top the pool. And oh, the last few minutes of that game were just ridiculous because we played bloody well. We played yeah. very, very well. Rob Wainwright scored a great try. And I think I kicked a, a few goals. And, and I do remember um, we'd conceded a penalty in about the, their 10-yard line. And there was a bit of back chat from, from one or two of the guys, and they moved them forward. And Thierry Lacroix kicked a goal with about 20 minutes to go. And it changed. The whole game changed. And then we conceded a try in about the fifth or sixth minute of injury time. And it was just typical... I hate to say typical Scotland, but it was just Scotland just yeah. doing everything in their power not to win the game. And it was just a crushing, crushing defeat because we would have unquestionably got to the semi-final had we, had we beaten France um, in that occasion. Yeah, I, mean, I thought Scotland were outstanding that day and, and having missed the famous victory in the Parc de France with the, the Tooney Gregor Townsend, Tooney <coughs> Flip, um, thankfully, I got back into the team, but that, that, that last few minutes of that, the intensity of that game and that rugby, Scotland played outstandingly well. But I just have, GG this memory of uh, I was playing centre, we drifted out uh, on the last attack play, on the defensive play. I shouted to Craig jo Joyner to stay out on his man, and I came across, uh, and I went from hero to zero because I was tackling Emile Antonac. Mm. Who, um, whose son Romain obviously is yeah. playing for France at this moment and all eyes will be on him. Yeah. And um, Emile just straightened, he just checked my stride. And I can just, I, I've seen it frame, frame by frame every now and again, this image of me just tackling Emile onto Matt and I, I just didn't quite hit him. And I just have, I, I'm screaming as he's going over and I can see it frame by frame. It's extraordinary oh, wow. how indelibly imprinted on my mind it is. So in sport, fine, you often talk about the fine margins of sport, winning and losing and the fantastic time. But every now and again, that image just comes in where I cannot stop him. And I'll wake up in the middle of the night. Oh. And this, this tackle just, I can, I can feel that tackle right now as he goes over the line. And, and our path to destiny was not against Ireland in the quarterfinal. It was again against the old foes, New Zealand, who were playing outstanding rugby in that tournament. You know, that game at Loftus Vestville against New Zealand was, was an extraordinary game of rugby. Um, there was a certain guy called Jonah Lomo who was playing that day. I mean, I, the icon... I wrote it down, but morning, I don't yeah. even know why. I yeah. mean, what he, was, he, was, he was an amazing. He was fantastic for our game. The game flipped after that because it became fully professional, JJ, and I think that was the turning point of rugby union. You know, but he was one of the greatest superstars of all time, and you know, I'd, my opposite number that day was a guy called Frank Bunce, who, funnily enough, was my opposite number playing against Western Samoa. Uh, I also got a try that day, and very emotional, you know, with with Gavin's last game. But there was huge disappointment that that was our World Cup journey in many respects over. And, um, and yet, you know, what, a, what an occasion, what a tournament. And then for New Zealand to go on to that final for South Africa to win for all sorts of reasons. Um, the friendships that we've had from not only the South African players, but the New Zealand players. And when Jonah used to come into town in Edinburgh, you know, the first, the first you know, couple of guys he'd phone is Gavin and myself. And we'd go and meet Jonah and, and, and catch up with him. And he was always a, a very private individual. But those were the... the the, the, the great days for us was the friendships that we formed over the years. And, and um, sadly, another one of uh, the players that we played against who is not with us anymore. And yet he, he transcended the game from that amateur into the professionalism and, and lifted the game of rugby union to where it is now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. My, I mean, this is an absolute honour to have got to do this and you know to be able to share the highs and lows of it and do you know what actually thank you you talk about those those hard memories you talk about those um you know those fine fine moments and margins thank you for doing it on our behalf do you know as fans you put yourselves out there you know physically mentally you know thanks for doing that for for ultimately our entertainment
We enjoyed it too, JJ. Yeah. It's okay. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear oh, it. Pleasure. Thank you very <laughs> much. Well done. Top man. Yeah. Cheers. Good man. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. To the famous grouse. Excellent. Roger. <laughs>